said, well, actually it is that simple. Um, Hebrew life is built on an inter- on eternal, unchanging and dependable reality. But one guy all this, he says, your thoughts have, have to come from somewhere. Mm-hmm. It has to have some sort of base. Um, because your thoughts relate to words and actions that follows. But the thought patterns has to have some sort of authority. And there's only three authorities. It's God, or another authority, another deity that we would say is the authority, or self. The Hebrew says it's God. He's eternal. He cannot change. And that makes him dependable. Unlike man. As opposed to a philosophy of life where I would have to depend on another man. <coughs> In life we discover very easily that that is not always true of all of us. Even we discover that of ourselves. Some people can't depend on us. Contrast the Greek philosophy. They start with man as opposed to starting with God. And then the attempt is to discover God or create gods or idols. They wouldn't necessarily call it idols, but that's what they do. They start with man and they work up, upwards. Is what in, in the New Testament, that is what we call Christology from below. Mm. Trying to understand Christ with the human mind. And it doesn't work that way. God tells me who he is and how I can possibly understand him. Aristotle is called the father of science. God, he says, and he, clu- and he concluded that motion must come, come from the prime mover who exists eternally and who we know <coughs> Therefore, Genesis is a theological interpretation of existence. Um, since God is the prime cause of material existence, he is superior to it and he has power over it. And he spread over the face of the earth. And it's chaos. And then Within six days, um, and the six days is more to signify, and here again, the six days is trying to give it what we call a historical framework. It's not necessarily saying 24 hour days, it's simply putting it into a framework to say, This is what I'm trying to say to you. Here is order. And, and, and the measure of this order is comprehensive. Because we're not only dealing with one little planet here, <coughs> we're dealing with the universe, we're dealing with the man that God created, the animals, the plant life, the sea life. <coughs> Does Genesis 1 or 2 of, is, the, is, the, is the error in the way it's set up in the, in the framework itself, or is there different emphasis? Genesis 1, the emphasis uh, they would argue is man's position in relation to the other areas of material existence. And then you have the climax on the sixth day with man being created. So you can see the beginning, and you see the only deal is by Makai. So does anybody do in this or my the pump of is burned with the bow? Compared to based on how all of it is. Mm. Genesis 2 deals with man's relation to his creator who formed him, places him in Eden, gives specific commands, he provides for him, <coughs> also creates him to have fellowship, which no other animal has, or other beast has. Um, he even gives him the capacity to relate to his creator and is subject to him. So Genesis 2 tells a completely different story. So what is the views of geologists? Um, as opposed to the recent science, previous method, methods that they use, the outdated methods that they use, now they are using what we call the radioactive dating to measure time and describe the past. Now this is a very tricky thing, because often they will use this type of dating, and sometimes it has been found one day. They're not sure about the continued formation of Earth, alright? Yet they are not actually sure whether Earth was in a molten or solid state at creation, so the God created 
all the opposite is is this ball of fire uh, and it's it's spewing out lava, continued lava, and the earth is cooling down. <coughs> the earth is cooling down, remember, then you have rain and wind, which produces sand over time. So it's, it's stages of development in the, in the formation of earth that they are looking at, and that's why they go to about 7 million years old. They also examine and explain the earth history by interpreting rock, rock layers, which contains fossils. We'll get to that now. Now there's different theories proposed for the formation of the Earth. Remember we spoke about the rock layers last week? Mm -hmm. um, each layer will give you different material objects. And that material object can then be dated with using the radioactive dating uh, method. And they can determine the age of the stuff. And that's why we can put dates in history. So while there's different theories proposed for the formation of of the earth, the author of Gen Genesis simply states, the power of God moved upon the formless matter and changed it into the earth, which brings forth plants and animals. Now, if you listen to how they state it, the then could they be saying the same thing as the geologists? That it happened all the time. Because it says just listen again, the power of God moved upon the formless matter and changed into the earth, which brings forth plants and animals. So that could have happened. There is also evidence found for the, what they would call the Jurassic period, dinosaurs and stuff. Mm. There is evidence in certain rivers in America where they found dinosaur uh, prints, footprints, but they found footprints of man as well at the same time, and that was not supposed to be happening. So you have all these inconsistencies to deal with. Obviously, they look at the weight of evidence. Same as in the court of law, they look at the weight of evidence. One weighs heavier, and they are more than likely to say the other, or to believe the other. Geological time. Okay, so there's the geological concept of time versus human experience. We're talking about seven, but then that is just a humongous amount of time, as opposed to the human experience, which possibly only 75,000 years ago. Scientists' views with regard to the length of time since creation, and here's just a brief summary. They started with a simple life of what we call algae, sponges, worms, which appeared, appeared a billion years ago. So, in between, you had the six billion years where nothing happened. And eventually, life started forming, that's what they're saying. Then, that developed, that simple algae, sponges, <coughs> and developed into moss and fish. And then, it developed into dinosaurs. And out of that, somewhere along came some man, which is 75,000 years ago. Now, what they do is, when they find these skeletal bones, they don't actually date the bone itself, which is an odd thing. They will date, they, it seems they can't, they don't know how to date the bones. They, they take the sands and rocks surrounding the discovered skeleton. And I, I need to do a bit of investigation on that just to, to understand why they do that and not specifically the bone itself. The surely the bone must be able to tell you something. Um, there was the movie called Lucy, uh, which they thought was the oldest primate. But then they also discovered Hardy. Hardy is here somewhere in northern um, Ethiopia. <coughs> and now, very recently, they've made a new discovery in Greece, which, according to them, may be even older than Luce and Hardy. And that would say that, uh, and, and that, uh, then they would probably develop a new theory to say that Africa is not the cradle of civilization anymore. Yeah, it's a very recent discovery. That wasn't the news now about a week or two ago. The story of religion cannot begin with the first submen according to geologists, because there's not enough evidence. Okay? So even if they go back in time where they discovered these uh, what we call submen, there's not enough material objects that they could find to put it together with these guys to say this and yet they maybe they they had their own burial sites 
or they had four little gods of using clay or whatever that's not going to be destroyed by now but they just have these bones so now they measure the <coughs> sand and the rock around it but they have nothing else to determine exactly what their life looked like or what they believed or what they were thinking the endophils to prove the man this there, for the first time, we have evidence of religious activity more based on theory than fact, obviously. You have the burial of the dead, you have food offerings uh, with, with it, the dead that's buried, and then you, you also have flints. Flints would be more something like a sharp little um, object, which is either used as a knife or maybe used as part of an arrow or a, uh, a spear to kill or hunt with. <coughs> Your first character remains. A distinguished also dated 75 years ago. He is found in Europe and West Asia. All right. um, now you have Lucy and Ari, which is older than that, and then Greece, which is the latest finding. So then we have what we call Crow Man. This is also the Crow Copper. There, they also found burial sites surrounded with food, ornaments, and food. And then you have the Mesolithic and Neolithic periods as 10,000 to 4,500 BC. Now, during those particular periods, here they have more finds, obviously, it seems. Mm. They find polished stones, instruments, which is either axes or arrowheads. There was the domestication of animals, it seems, pottery, plating, weaving, building of crude houses and boats. That would probably be using straw and clay, that type of thing. And there also possibly human sacrifice, <coughs> wives and servants, um, especially if it's for somebody significant that passed away. They also performed cremation, uh, which is not such a new thing. If you go and look at the, uh, the Vikings used to do cremation. Mm. So they would send them out into the wind pile of the sea, shoot the burning arrow. You also had symbols of nature worship, like around objects, stones and pillars, even stars and trees. Now, the cradle of civilization, or at least what we, we believe according to evidence, would be Mesopotamia. So we just look at a little bit of the geography around surrounding it. Cradle uh, of Mesopotamia is called the cradle of civilization, or between the two rivers. Now, uh, Mesopotamia is surrounded, ah, Jesus, is bounded on the west by a Sahara Arabian desert, the east of the foothills of the <coughs> mountains, north Taurus Mountains, and south the Persian Gulf. Can you picture that in your mind? Take a look at the pictures in that book. Because if you're looking at the pictures, you should have a good idea of what it looks like. And for example, if you look at Palestine, Obviously, it's the Mediterranean, it's in the game. Okay, so it will be arc. It was 600 miles long, 300 miles wide, and very, very fertile. Just in inches of annual rainfall, and they depended on the two rivers. The Sumerians here developed an elaborate system of canals for irrigation purposes. Because what happened is sometimes it was it was almost like it looked like oh, steps oh. As, as the air went down. And, or they would literally build steps for the irrigation to water their particular areas. So it is also considered the first settlers and first high civilization in history of mankind. With great urban centers like Iridu, Ur, Ur, we'll obviously talk a little bit about later, especially for Abram's sake. Lars and Lagash and Pur and Kish. Um, a lot of these cities would be laying along these rivers, obviously. Okay. Uh, you had the non Semites, which followed them. Uh, <coughs> the Semites. Um, they were also, Sumerians were also the forerunners of the Babylonian civilization. So each of these civilizations had followed the one lens from the other. They were fused with native population. Native population meaning Semitic and non-Semitic. So to be different groups of people. Okay? And they developed a high level of political power and economic wealth. Language gradually developed. Like with every nation that is a power, their language will take over. The Greeks, you look at the Romans, their language will eventually take over. Same with the Babylonians. Um, 
So they also developed what we call a cuneiform system of writing. A cuneiform system is just with rich little shapes. <coughs> An effective tool for communication. The king of Kish, Etana, was the first ruler of Sumer around about 3000 BC. And later, the later king, Meskia Gasher, founded the dynasty at the city of Kerf, according to Genesis 10. And here we also start using the word to confirm certain things as much as we're using geology and archaeology to confirm a lot of these events. You'll see as we go along, we'll start adding the word to confirm certain dates and places and times. They controlled an area from the Mediterranean Sea to the Zagros Mountains. Um, now that would run from the west right across Syria. It's a huge expense of an area. And so we're not into, um, we're almost into the Asian part already. That's how far it extended. Erkish, the poor, we had temples at Sumerian God, and Dil was located and became the most important religious and spiritual center of Sumer. <coughs> Those were the major cities during that, that particular time, or what we would call city. <coughs> That's, it would be something like Cape Town. That it would be well developed, um, or, or Johannesburg. I'm not sure if it was that big that time of year. And Ur, for the first time, is an uncovering of a royal cemetery. The king was a deputy of patent guard of the city state. You see what they do with the king? He's one under. The same as if we'll see later when we get to the pharaohs, you have the deity and you have the pharaoh just under him, who was considered maybe the son of that particular god that was worshipped or cult that they had. Kingship to them was in a matter of divine election. They, gods, could withdraw or bestow blessing. What I want you to do is just listen very closely when I share this stuff with you because you'll see how all of this influences eventually Israel's own thought patterns about who God is. Now, it's not unimaginable for someone who's unrighteous to have some understanding of God or what he actually um, wants from us. It, for example, kingship is a matter of divine election. It's not foreign to the Hebrews. Um, they call God to withdraw or bestow blessings. The central feature of Sumerian religion in each of these things was what we call a ziggurat. We spoke about that. It's placed with step terraces with a small room and a niche for a statue of the deity on the top. We have An, which is the sky god, then our divine force of heaven. You have Ki, the earth god, Enlil, the air god, uh, manifested by the storm, and then you have Enki, water, the rain, which fertilizes the ground. If you go to um, Asia, you'd find Similar ideas with them with regards to sky, earth, air, and water. Um, it's quite interesting how all of this spread across the world, these ideas. Um, for example, they would even judge you by, by your eyes. They would say your eyes reflect out of water, earth, or sky, or fire, and it would determine your personality. Development of Indian religion. 
inventing and developing, uh, we still with Sumerian, the Sumerian culture, they invented, developed the cuneiform or wedge shift system of writing, written communication, which increased the cultural progress of the entire ancient world. There was the cuneiform writings excavated in Sumer, uh, records of economic, legal, and administrative methods. It included myths, ethics, lamentations, problems, fables, and essays. A lot of it that we see in the Bible. So the literature is, uh, is developing here. We will see that in, in, that literature forms also in, in, in the word. They established a system of education. Uh, at the schools, they trained, trained their scribes and secretaries, mathematical tables and dictionaries. They uh, invented the wheel and arch and produced the calendar. Uh, metal working using wax models and clay. They even had social classes during that particular time. And when social class obviously pops its head, economic exploitation follows. Andres follows. It's a natural course of history. It's not new. If it happened then, it will happen now. Man hasn't changed. Always keep in mind there's nothing new under the sun. And Andres followed in the third millennium BC. Priests developed into a wealthy class that managed the possessions of the gods. Prosperity gospel. Good grief. In 3000 BC. So there's nothing new. It's just that man is pretty stupid. He won't study history, so he'll get caught out again and again and again. But well, that's our own fault. That's why the rich stays rich, because he actually does know history. Escalating debt of the poor saw the advent of sla slavery. Um, when you have some the culture of the law, um, which is the law of Hammurabi, which will be worth later. Um, but that's what happened. Obviously, when, when there's slavery, when there's oppression, the poor will cry out for rights. And they will cry to the, the, the officials that exist at that particular time. So we in culture one reason. Wars were considered to be struggles between the gods of respective cities. Pride and profit gained from <coughs> encouraged leaders actually to engage in war, which is also not new. If you think of America, who so easily dispenses with, with, with weapons of war and sells to terrorist groups and then they want to blame them afterwards, um, it, it, there's nothing new. A lot of the profits that they make for the country is from weapons of war. They sell it. And for who they sell it? They, the the selling is indiscriminate. It doesn't matter who it is. Because the government itself doesn't sell the weapons of war. Um, there are individual parties who are not attached to the government who will actually sell the stuff for them. But they don't sell it. They won't have a name attached to it. After the Sumerians, you have the rise of the Arcadians. Sumerian culture is at its peak, but they, when that happens and, and life is good, then we tend to ignore what's happening around us. Same thing happening here. They ignore the developing threat to the north in the region of, of, of Middle Mesopotamia. And then you have King Sargon and his wife, who establishes a guard in 2350 BC. Now, archaeology gives evidence that he and his powerful grandson, Naramsin, came claim control from the Mediterranean Sea to the Persian Gulf, including Nineveh. And Nineveh is quite far, Nineveh belongs to Babylon. Ishtar, the goddess of human fertility, received tribute for their success. So they also have a specific god who is uh, uh, what we call the, or the premium god at that particular time for them would be Ishtar. Naramsin was eventually defeated by the Gutians. So here we have a takeover again by the Gutians. The of the people from modern Iran again. A god completely destroyed and never rebuilt again after that. The eight, the caliph was supplanted, supplanted the Sumerian language. Yet the latter's literary work was continued. So you see how they, they carry over some of the culture, but their own language will now take precedence. It's, it's a way of enslaving people. You force them to take on your language. Because language also has to do with identity. 
You also have the infiltration of Semitic dialects, which is not unusual if you think of the development of Afrikaans in our country. Afrikaans was not uh, a language. It developed over time. Yeah. With the infiltration of, of people from, 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 from Asia, slaves, people of African origin. You have the Brits and Afrikaans, you have this mix of language and eventually the ability to take them together. Language. They included Eastern Canaanites, Amorites, or Amorites, and those who spoke Aramaic and eventually Arabic. Then you have the rise of Ur after that. The city state of Gash under Governor Gudia, as well as Erech, gained freedom from the Gudians, and so now states over now again. The Gash and Ur, Ur fought for control of Sumer now. When we talk about city states, these are quite huge states. Um, city states, so big that they have their own little armies present there. If you just think of Abraham, we'll get you later, um, when you went to go and fish one, he had 380 trained men. There is a lot of people. Ur Nama was the ruler of Ur. He established the third dynasty of Ur. He subdued much of Mesopotamia. He compiled the law code to enforce justice. So you can see the development all the time. One blending from the other and then just developing it bigger all the time. Then you have what we call the Amuro, or Semitic nomads, which migrated from the Arabian Desert in control of the important cities. After that, you have the Edomites. So it goes on. So the East who captured Ir, and it seems Abram's family may have departed from Ur at the time of the fall of the third dynasty of Ur. The relationship of Genesis 3 11 to Mesopotamia, or what we call the Garden of Eden, there are some interesting stories around this particular one. Um, the word for Eden may be related to the Sumerian Arcadian Edom, meaning wilderness or fire. <coughs> So the two rivers in Genesis 2.10 are the Tigris and the Euphrates. It is concluded that the Garden of Eden was located in Mesopotamia. The rivers Pison and Gyr have still not been identified. Right. Remember that rivers change shape constantly. Um, so depending on where they were laying, they could have joined up. Depending on the rainfall in the area, if the rainfall diminished, those rivers would no longer be flowing also. So all of those uh, what we call ge genealogical um, influences that can change the shape of the land. The right of Jesus place at the beginning of man in Mesopotamia, where early civilization developed. Now, very interesting, besides the public account of the flood, in the ancient Sumerian, Babylonian and the Syrian writings, there is also a simple story of the flood. Babylon, the story says the gods plotted to destroy the world by a flood, and Ea, their god, commanded, sorry, Ea, a, a man, was commanded to build the ship. In the Sumerian story, the gods are kept at making man. You see, there's some, there's some similarities. And animals have decided to send a flood to destroy humanity. And the priest king, Siyasudra, informed by Enki, the water god, of the impending flood, built a large boat. Mm. Now, alluvial deposits at Shurupak, which is about 18 inches deep, dating plus minus 3200 BC, indicates a severe flood in the area. <coughs> at Uri, you also have alluvial clay dating plus minus 4000 BC, indicating a flood. <coughs> but again, you see how they, there's arguments and there's counter arguments. However, this may be due to natural deposits again. Scholars call it the grief floods. Uh, in the if the flood is an actual historical occurrence. Despite the lack of evidence, there is not sufficient reasons to discuss the public account of the flood. So as much as there is evidence, there is not enough evidence to say either or. At various times since the day of the Cephas, that is between 37 and 180, there is still evidence um, now, Mount Ararat will be laying on the border of Turkey, Iran, and Soviet Union, where the border is laying. That's where the mountain is laying. So. In 1955, there's this Frenchman, Fernand Navarra, who actually reaches the area, and he must have slipped in somehow, uncovered a piece of hand you would estimate it to be about 5,000 years old. So there's all that evidence. 
Archaeological discoveries in Mesopotamia have given us as much information on the culture and customs of Abraham and Cespus. The account of Genesis in Genesis of early mankind can be put in a real historical setting. Sometimes you need some sort of historical framework, but not necessarily a chronological one. Information on cuneiform tablets helps us understand some of the biblical customs. Genesis attributed traditionally to Moses who would not have recorded the account of creation before 1400 BC. That's in the interest of the writing, it seems. And then you have to remember Moses would have learned how to write. Mm. Um, creation and flood stories is handed down orally. And in comparison, it's obvious that the author of Genesis was guided by God's Abraham and his kinsmen. In the Deuteronomy chapter 6, 26 verse 5, is actually identified as an Arab man. Aaron is also listed as a son of Shem in Genesis 10 too. They are considered as scattered nomadic people, mentioned in the Akkadian records as early as 2700 before Christ. There's also references to them in the Amara text from Mari and also in the tablets recovered at Yubera. We'll obviously deal with that little in depth as we go along. The name Aram suggests the era of Aram <coughs> and thus the close relationship to the people of Aram were the Israelite patriarchs more than Ur actually. Aram would be more than mm-hmm. uh, the, the area that would associate with it rather than Ur. Like I said earlier, you had the Sumerians, Akkadians took over, the Kutians, and you had the third dynasty of Ur, a resurgent of the Sumerian culture. Um, and then the Elamites follow, and they would all have an influence on Abram's culture. So it's a takeover from one power to the next. The, or the Urnamastella, remember the Urnamastella is literally a stone with inscription writing on it, okay? Either writing or. <coughs> it, it looks like a painting on a stone, it's, it, it's engraved, it, and it depicts stories and stuff like that. Um, it depicts the building of a Zugarat in this case. So, Median power lasted about 1500 years, and that is a long time. It's the longest time that I think the power has actually lasted. If you look at all the other powers in these states, it's not that long. You have Sumer, Nasa, and Ur fell to the Elamites, and the Amor- Amorites from Mari held Akkad. Right? Then you have the people of northwestern Mesopotamia and northern Syria. Uh, which in the Cuneiform text was also called the Amoro. I keep in mind this is named for the Amoro come up right there again. The Amorite text from Mari mentioned Aramaeans, but there is no clear break in the continuity between the Amoric Amorites who settled at Mari and the Aramaeans who followed them in the same region. You see what they discovered? They discover all these texts, they discover all these different peoples. The problem is trying to use this archaeological evidence to put together a history or chronological account of history. And sometimes it's very difficult, sometimes they kind of hang loose from each other. Perhaps a guru was a general term referring to Northwest Semites, which included Amorites and the Aramean ancestors of the Hebrews. So in this case they would be called the Amburu. At other times they called the Habiru. At other times they called the Apiru. Um, the names seem close enough or similar enough, but that doesn't tell you anything. Abram and his kinsmen may have been part of a western migration of the Ammonites of this period. And that you'll find in Genesis 11 31 and Genesis 24. It is uncertain when Abram left Ur of the Chaldees and resettled in Aram for two reasons. There was invasion of the Gutians and the Elamites. So obviously with the, with the political upheavals, it was a good time maybe for them to leave. Now this is seen as the reason, or according to us, Yahweh spoke through some other event to him and said to him, now is the time, a good time to leave and go to Canaan uh, where I will give you a nation, where I will bless you. We had the Amorites in the north, that is at Mari and Ashur and Nisan, and then in Babylon, and Lhasa, which was lower Mesopotamia, 
Uh, and then lastly, the between city states, the Emirates, I'm just referring to a, a group of people, um, and those would be the towns or city states that they were at, which is my assurance, Isa, in case I just wrote it up differently. So they wouldn't have defined lines which have characterized and said, this is my country. We just literally have a, a piece, a huge piece of land um, from where they would move in and out and where they would just dominate. The age of Hammurabi. <coughs> he is the sixth king of the first dynasty of Babylon, who defeats last of the Ilamat power in Sumer and he rules for 42 years. Even though the Semites were in control of Sumerian culture, remained dominant. However, the letters uh, of language, however, were extinct. There's another set of found or foundation tablets, uh, bricks, clay, cone, and illustrated letters, also some from Mari, found at Susa, dating about 17,000 BC. Now, in this, in this one, the stella of the foundation tablets, they found evidence of, of, of the god Marduk, who was considered the greatest deity of Babylon. They found evidence of the epic or the story of Gilgamesh and the creation epic. Now, this creation epic they used to recite the festivals, which was very popular, they used to do it annually. And it made <coughs> of, 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 of how often God used to tell uh, the leaders to recite the Torah to the people, and to read it again and to remind them. If you go back to Moses, uh, before Moses leaves, he retells the story of, of the history of how God brought them out. You'll often find that little history found in some reforms when people are uh, uh, saying to, to another person that this is our God. Let me tell you about it. If you go to what it's uh, X, on two occasions you'll find a similar thing where they retell the story from creation as to how it came to Jesus. So there's always this retelling, um, which is not a new thing either. Um, also in the Stella or foundation tablets, they found a law code mainly relating to economic life and the regulation of commerce. Uh, it also gave uh, evidence of classes, and one of the rules there clearly that comes out there is eye for an eye. If you go to the log, you sometimes see the very same an eye for an eye. Even so, Jenna Daran, the people were attracted to Iran because they were nomadic. Again, the area provided grazing for land for sheep. Uh, in the Mari tablets, the towns are mentioned in ecological archaeological finds that are related to the name of Abram's relatives. A very interesting. Haran, which is a, a town, is also the, the name of Abram's brother. Uh, then you have Neo, which is a city, uh, but, he's, oh, but it's also the name of the grandfather and brother. We have Terra, or Tulta Turaki, which is the town, which is Abram's father, Serug, which is the grandfather of Terra, and then Pelek, or Palega, which is the city, which is an ancestor of Abram. Now, why was these names important? Arabs and Calaway say that these names of towns, that are also names of Abram's ancestors, suggest that the land of Iran was much more closely associated with Abram's background than Ur. Because most of those towns would surround the Haran. The tribal chiefs' names, if you go back in time, you will also see that these tribal chiefs' names are also the names of, of, of cities or settlements. It also fitted the customs of the day. Therefore, the argument is a little more plausible. And therefore, the connection with the Amorites who migrated to Palestine in the 19th century BC. Because that's where the Amorites came from. Mm -hmm. The land of Canaan. Canaanite was our right word and meaning <coughs> purple. In, in Phoenicia, uh, 
Tunisia in Greek it means purple, is the name Greeks gave to Cain. They called Cain Phoenicia, Palestine Cain Phoenicia. It's usually a red dye that they got from the Schultz. Yeah, they actually got the dye out of Schultz, which was in Boston. But that's how they got the colors, the red and the purples. That's how they got the name. Just some geographical features which encourage isolation of the land of Canaan. Um, you'll see it's similar to, to Egypt. Egypt was also kind of protected in the sense that if you look at the rivers and in the desert, so they concentrated. So if you wanted to invade them, you had to go to the desert, literally. Um, on the south and east you would have the wilderness and desert, or Negev as they would call it, and then on the west the Mediterranean Sea, on the north you'd have the Lebanon Mountains and Mount Hermon. Um, also very important about the land of Canaan, it provided important trade routes through Canaan. Not only connected the north, uh, but it also connected Asia with them. So that most of those trade routes run through them. So therefore, you would see the influence of cultures always coming in. If you think of the day of Pentecost, that's how they came in, because of the trade routes that brought them there. It was also, the same trade routes was also used as passageways for invading armies, obviously. Um, civilizations breached by Canaan, was Mesopotamia, Asia, and Egypt. So they were in the midst of, 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 of these world empires. Many cultural developments from these advanced civilizations was transmitted through the Canaanites to the Israelites. Um, <coughs> and of those cultural developments, we have the alphabet, Bible. If you go to the Syrian texts, they use the word Biblos. And here we have the word Bible. That's how far back it goes. Um, the literary styles was the, um, uh, uh, transmitted to them. Architecture, religious practices. Um, the Amana letters indicate the presence of non-Semitic languages in Canaan. For example, the Hittites who lived in the Judean hills. And then you also have the Hittite Empire, which he didn't expand this far. But yet their presence in the country is unexplained. And there's a number of texts that speak to to the Hittites that were in the area. By the second millennium BC, BC the ruins of the non-Semitics entered Upper Mesopotamia and then Canaan. Linguistic evidence, scriptural refs, cuneiform inscriptions and names give evidence that they were well established at the time of Abraham. There's also the cuneiform tablets from Biblical Tanakh. 15,000 BC, um, and then you have the tablet from Shechem, remember Aimo, mm. Genesis 34, which contain probable Hurrian names. You have Gibbon, Gib Gibbon the, uh, which is a Hebite center, you go to Joshua 9, 9, 7, 9, you find evidence of that. Then you have the Jebusites, Hebites, and Horites, which may also be references to the Hurrians. So it seems a lot of these names are interchangeable. It could possibly be that one race called another race by another name and not necessarily their own. Like we do sometimes. And sometimes derogatory because and it's not impossible that it happened at that time too. The text confirm the influence of some of the customs of Avon. And you have excavations in Canaan. Raids by warlike numbers on the east and south caused decreasing population and abandonment of many settlements in the area of the southern Transjordan. Now this is all the preparation before Abraham moves in. It's almost like the land has been cleaned up. Cleaned out. Uh, however, Egyptian sources um, give evidence that there were settlements in part of Palestine which were starting to develop into city-states. Obviously when they move into the country, the east of the states again uh, by the time that they, they get into Canaan. Abrams and his descendants migrated to the thinly populated hill country of the Dead Sea. Mm. 
He spent most of his time in the, in the Gate, which is dry in Hebrew, in the southern part of Palestine, which has about a 50 centimeter rainfall per year. So, very important, if you go back to the stories of the wells, you'll see how important the part of played amongst the nomadic tribes. Those wells would be pro considered property, and they would literally fight over it. However, there was also the trade route because of copper ore deposits. It's the promise of descendants given at Shechem in the central Canaan uh, in Genesis 12 7. Then Abram moves on to Egypt because of famine, uh, but that also indicates possibly the influence that Egypt had or the control they had over Palestine at that particular time. As you said earlier, because there's evidence that they give in their writings that there were settlements in the area, so they were very much aware of what was going on. Either if they were controlling or just using the trade routes to pass through Canaan. Genesis 40 describes the invasion of Canaan by an alliance of four kings from Mesopotamia. And archaeological discoveries have actually proved Genesis 40 with the description of the invasion. Archaeological finds give evidence that the Genesis 40 narrative coincides with the circumstances of the Jordan Valley at that particular time. Remember? Um, obviously when Abram went after them, they destroyed, they left nothing. Yeah. Ashtaroth and Karnaim were occupied by the Rephans, destroyed and desolate for three centuries after the attack of Shadolo Leoma. So you have this desolation and then you have the rebuilding of the cities again. The invaders followed a known trade route or what they called the, later the King's Highway according to Numbers 2017. But their, in, their interests were more the rich mineral deposits because of the, 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 the copper in the area. Abraham and his Abraham confederates overtook them at Hobah and recovered the spot. I'm going to read the story in Genesis 14. I think you should know what Genesis 14 is. Sorry, what? Okay. That's, that's chapter 14. We are going to deal with that now. Date of the Patriarchs. Abraham's birth and interest into Canaan. Uh, they say it's almost impossible to fix the date. However, however Bishop Asher, 1996 BC, determines that Abraham's birth should be around about 1728 BC, according to Joseph's descent into Egypt. If you go to Exodus 12:40. It says that there will be 400, is this, almost this prophecy that there will be 430 years in Egypt. The Septuagint, however, includes the sojourn in Canaan of 215 years in 430 years. So we have this little discrepancy, which is going to cause problems, obviously, with the dating of the Exodus. Because while the one text says they there for 40, 430 years, the Septuagint, which is Greek, the Greek, uh, the translation of the Hebrew Bible into Greek, includes the, uh, the uh, Abraham's and his patriarch sojourn in, in Canaan. They include that 215 years as well. So you can to have a, a slight uh, discrepancy in the dates. The names of biblical patriarchs, and this is the odd thing, not discovered in any excavations as yet. Isaac, not um, Jacob, um, not even Joseph's name is mentioned. So it's impossible to link <coughs> the biblical patriarchs to historical events of other cultures. While other cultures' histories have been reconstructed on the basis of extensive archaeological evidence, we are also uh, dependent on those histories and their discoveries to construct the history for Israel. It doesn't seem that they... This, the Bible was a theological work rather than an actual historical work. They themselves never kept a historical record. 
we trans further we transmitted that down the generations. It's more when you get to the kings, um, chronicles, there you'll find uh, history. However, those documents too, if you go to them and we'll deal with it in one of the other chapters, same thing applies. It's more than just historical records, it's a theological interpretation of God's relationship with man. Date of the Patriarchs, it's best to place Abraham's presence in Canaan shortly after 2000 BC. He was a chief, chieftain of the sizable clan, originally located in the area of Ur of the Kals and later in the plain of Aram Yaran. Again, Genesis 14, we'll see that they generally they're very peaceful. However, if they attack or they need to, they will they will take up the sword. And in the case of, of Lot, that is exactly what they did. The Abiru. Now for the first time we have this name, the Abiru. <coughs> the term appears in text taken from the third dynasty of Ur, which is around about 2040 BC. It at first meant Hebrew or Abel descendants. Then at the fourth international conference of the study of religious. Opinions vary, and the weight of evidence presented seems to relate the word to a class rather than a race of, of people. Okay. Now, probably foreign persons who gained economic security in the society by having themselves out as slaves. Um, they were aggressive, traded <coughs> communities and ambushed small uh, caravans, which we would call guerrilla warfare in and out, in and out, it's a specific area that they dominate. It's almost on their journeys that they do war and in their travels. <coughs> it's also possible that they had some connection with the Abiru. It's also possible that they are okay, engaged in caravan trading um, at Lagish, Nineveh and Haran. But these are probable and possible uh, uh, conclusions that we can draw from the archaeological discoveries. Still the customs of the priest patriarchs. Um, there's quite a lot of influence, especially the Hurrian law or the Nutsi text. Prohibited the direct sale of land. So land was transferred by inheritance only. Okay? Mainly by inheritance. Under the guise of adoption in which slaves were made Yes, that's if there was no son born to the wife. Okay? And Nutsi custom obligates the childless wife to provide her husband a slave to get children for a head. And in this case, in Abraham's case, Sarah gives the Egyptian land by her. There you go. Uh, and she was entitled to treat Hagar's offspring as her own. Remember when they gave birth, she was sitting in her lap and then the baby uh, was born she would actually physically catch the baby and be hers. So the first contact that I get really had was with the wife and not with the slave, with the handmaid. However, if the son is born to the wife later, then he will become the rightful heir. The slave, however, still shares in the inheritance. And that's why Abram was a little bit upset when she <coughs> tried to chase Hagar and Ishmael away. Mm. Because of the wedding law, or the, according to the text, that was not supposed to happen. Also, under these laws, they found that birthright was negotiable among members of the family. Looking at the case of Jacob and um, Esau, mm -hmm. um, so it's not unusual for that to happen. There's actually a text which tells the man who negotiates his birthright. In the Nazi culture, a man who had no one may adopt the son, give the adopted son his daughter for a wife. In this case, we use Levin and Isaac as an example. Establish the adopted son as his heir. Now it seems Laban adopted Jacob, but later had sons of his own according to Genesis 31.1. Children born to the adopted son would not have any claim if a natural son was born after the adoption. And that's why Leah's that's the reason for Leah's complaint. Because mm. now they would receive nothing actually. They would act they actually married out in this case. But that was the agreement that he actually made with with with, with, with Jacob. Um, Rachel taking the household gods of her father Laban and further Jacob had the right to the property of Laban. The contract between Jacob and Laban, Jacob was not to marry other wives. Besides Laban's daughters, 
So if he wanted to know, he wanted to come back and get some another door with it. He had no claim to Laban's property, therefore there was a legal release from filial duties, meaning that if anything happened to the other sons and daughters, <coughs> Jacob, Leah and Rachel did not have to return to come look after the uh, adopted or uh, their father or his adopted uh, father. They didn't have, come, have to come back to do that. <coughs> Jacob's return to the promised land signified the re-establishing of the Abraham covenant. And like Abraham, uh, if you read in one of the chapters where they had to put away the foreign gods, where the two tells the Rachel, we now have to let go of these gods. The same like Abraham had to leave the foreign gods behind and believe in Yahweh. So when he leaves uh, uh, um, Laban's household and God has to deal with him again and he establishes the established covenant, that's the first thing that happens. He needs to go of his gods. Jacob is called a supplanter until his name change, which is Israel, which means God strove. You had the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham and Raja came. Uh, remember, there were five Pharisee cities on the plain of the southern end of the Dead Sea Sodom and Gomorrah, Akma, Zohar, and Zebon. And their wickedness was punished with the sulfur and fire. I'm not going to go into the whole story. Genesis 43 identifies the area as the Valley of Sidon. There is no traces of the cities anymore. And it is according to the deduction that they say that it might be some merge under the southern part of the Dead Sea. Okay? The appearance also stands in the nearby mountain Jebel Susan, or the Gold Mount of Sol. It's made up of crystalline salts and stuff like that, which couldn't possibly come from, from the pine and salt also. Ancient writers including modern investigators and geologists from Kerr. Then lastly, Yahweh is able to use natural resources for his purpose and never forget. And this is for one can let us please give an overview of okay. Um, as an introduction, Egypt is referred to as the gift of the Nile because Egypt is a desert country with little rain is referred to as the gift to the Nile because Egypt is a desert country with little rainfall and the Nile makes life possible. Um, originally you have the blue Nile which starts in Ethiopia, you have the white Nile which starts in Victoria <coughs> and they join that one and cut through to form the major artery which runs through right through to the delta on top of, of northern Africa. You also have five rapids or what they call cataracts um, and you also have been along, have along these cataracts, you have ancient empires that occupied certain areas. And most of what you'll find is built along um, the river itself. Originally, the rainfall was quite widespread and then it decreased. So, what happened is it forced men to move inwards, um, to move alongside the Nile. Now, with the rest of the area becoming desert, your Hunting becomes, the opportunities for hunting becomes less because it's less wild animals to, to hunt. So you literally force into agriculture. Okay? So that's how it develops. Just quickly to, to, to the ancient empires of the fourth Catholic, you have the kingdom of Kush. Between the third and the first Catholic, you have Nubia, and then to the north, which is the first Catholic or the first rapid, you'll have Egypt. <coughs> um, Originally, like I say, excessive seasonal rainfall in Central Africa, uh, which results in annual flooding. And then at the top of the Nile, we have a system of lakes where this water runs into. And what these lakes do is they then become a source which assures a steady flow of water and rich soil all the time. So the, the ground remains fertile. The annual flooding and its resultant economic overflow was attributed to three gods. There was Hapi, not Hapi, Hapi, uh, which referred to the abundance provided by the Nile. Then you have Osiris, which is the lord of inundation, inundation simply meaning more than, 
almost kind of never ending mode. Um, then you have through the annual floods. The survival of Egypt was celebrated with official celebrations. And this was yearly. There's a hymn of praise um, called the Adoration of the Nile that has actually survived from the 14th century. They still have the text available to this day. Mm-hmm. Um, <coughs> the desert areas, as I said to you earlier, uh, surrounding the Nile insulated Egypt from invasion. And the Nile also made it possible, made possible development of an early civilization with rich soils along the banks. You have 30 dynasties ruling Egypt from 3000 to 350 BC. 30 different dynasties or powers or kings that, that ruled during that time. Um, or stated otherwise, that <coughs> periods or ages, you originally have the old kingdom or pyramid age, and we'll deal with them individually now quickly. The first intermediate period, the middle kingdom, the second intermediate period, which included the Hyksos, um, and possibly also Abram and Joseph and so forth. And then you have the New Kingdom, the period of weakness, the open and Semitic periods, which we won't deal with. I think we'll just go as far as the New Kingdom of, of Empire. We will not speak to the period of weakness, nor the Ethiopian and Semitic periods, or Persian, Ptolemic, Ptolemic and Roman periods. We won't deal with those last three. But please note, when they put it in these orders, this is approximate dates. Some of the dates can be confirmed, obviously, from the status that they that they have discovered. So there is actual date specific kings. And very interesting, Egypt has been inhabited since the Stone Age. They actually found the evidence for their flints. Decreasing rainfall forced men to pursue <coughs> culture rather than hunting. And because that happened, you now have villages developing and they became more permanent, obviously. All right? And out of these villages come five developments. They drain the marshes, develop irrigation systems, obviously to move the water inland so they can uh, send the water through to their fields and stuff. You have the plow, you have the art of brick making, the use of cylinder seals for rolling impressions on wet clay, imported from Mesopotamia. You have sculptures and architecture, and then you also have the mining of copper and metallurgy. Metallurgy is simply meaning taking um, the, the copper and forming it into something useful, like a bowl or a vase. We also have the development of, religi- of religion. Now, there was three primary cults, and again, like I said, when I deal with these things, take note of the little things that comes through that we eventually might find in the Israelite religion, the development of the Israelite religion. You have the first cult, which is Re, or Ra, sometimes they call it Ra, or the sun god. In Heliopolis, as they say, Re or Ra was self-created from the waters of the underworld. And you in Genesis chapter 1, God separated the waters about the waters below. All other cosmic deities emanated from him. They in turn those <coughs> other gods, and therefore you have this whole pantheon of gods in Egypt. And then you had Thoth, son of the falcon deity Horus, um, and that was in the city Hemopolis. Now remember, you'll see here also all of these centers, each, even though it's in the Egyptian culture, each center has its own god who is the main god. Maybe, uh, Thos was represented by an ibis. Now, according to them, he created the world, controlled nature. He was, he was the bestower of culture. He was also considered very wise, and he judged men's hearts. You see, so we have an idea of God. That's actually what theology is. In its, in, in, in its, in its smallest form, theology is an idea or a thought about God. <coughs> yeah, then you had Buddha in Memphis. He was given priority over other gods, and he was also called the Great Cosmic Mind, and produced the world with his thought and its contents with the projection of his thoughts. Very important, Pharaoh seen as God during Moses' time. 
Remember they also consider him the son of God, but he's also seen as a God. Oops, that should be a small one. Just a historical summary of Egypt, and we'll run through this kingdom now quickly, the old kingdom, which is the original kingdom in Egypt, 2700 to 2200 BC. I didn't put in the BC there, so just keep that in mind. It begins with the third dynasty, so this is the first evidence that they actually have. They don't have evidence of the first dynasty. Uh, they, they don't have enough evidence of the first and the second dynasty. <coughs> um, in the third dynasty, you have <coughs> the step pyramid being built, 200 feet high of Dosha, a turret of Ibotech. Ibotech was a magician, priest. <coughs> And if you consider the, the courts of Egypt, you will find all of that there when Moses went to go and represent God on the of God. He was considered an architect, physician, and a sage. So he was quite a learned man. The king as God was assured of eternal life um, and needed an enduring court, and that's why these pyramids were built for them. Because apparently when he went in there, he would meet Osiris there. Uh, um, he, would become, he, he would go before the judgment sheet and they would sit Osiris. Osiris was also a god that moved into what we call the netherworld and there he reigned. And he was kind of the halfway stop. And he decided whether you continued or not. And obviously you would rule in your own kingdom there as well. It's almost like you became a god, is this idea. Of, of, of being transformed into a God. Then you have the fourth dynasty, 2650 to 2500, uh, which constructed the three pyramids of Giza. Uh, it was the great pyramid built as a tool for Kufu, an engineering marvel. This is quite huge stuff. They say the amount of stone that they had to move and the, the size of the stone, the, the um, The areas there to move it across. The, they say it's, if you look at today's engineering and what we have available, yes, we can possibly also put it together. But for them to do it at that time already, they say it was incredible for them to achieve this kind of uh, um, not only architecture and putting this thing together so precisely. The work was very precise. Um, but it was just amazing for them to understand how they could mathematically draft such a plan and actually bring it together. So the mathematics had to be of the highest order. Remember, any engineer must do mathematics. Mm -hmm. He must understand the mathematics. <coughs> then you had the second which was built for Kafre, um, and the third for Menkaro, Kaure. Uh, near to the second, you have the famous Sphinx, remember? Is this um, almost a line which is sitting down but with a human head. That's the Sphinx. Then you have the fifth dynasty during this time, 2500 to 2350. During that time, we also have the discovery of the Pyramids, who was like the deceased king before ju the judgment seat of Osiris. <coughs> the next is the first intermediate period. The problem here is kings are not so wise, their rule is not so effective, and there's a disintegration in the kingdom. All right? And a lot of social upheaval follows. There's two constructive forces, however, that emerge, especially in social upheaval. Um, one of the things that happens in social upheaval, even in our own lives, is we become reflective. Because we're going to dunk. We're going to say here. And, and, and the, the forces that emerged is a recognition that confidence in materialism was inadequate. There's also development of a sense of social justice. Now look how the, it, look how the, the theology also adjusts. They now say that every good man had the chance of becoming the god of Cyrus at death and emptying into eternal <coughs> That privilege was no longer for the king only. The only man in this was saying, you can become that, and why not I? What makes you more special than me? These developments took place just prior to the time of Abraham. <coughs> then you have the Middle Kingdom, 
2008 and releasing the US of Upper Egypt gain control and reunited the country after the, the second uh, period. Uh, peace and stability followed the United 12 dynasty 1990 to 1780 BC. Here they developed new political and social structural, uh, structures along feudalistic lines. Uh, feudalism is simply um, where the king would own most of the property, and you have that in, in, in Europe as well. Um, during the Dark Ages and after that, you had feudal systems where the king or whoever was in charge owned most of the land, would either give it to high ranking officials or would rent it out to people who would provide a service or even something off the land back to the king. But the land essentially remained his. They added territory, they utilized mineral wealth, they developed the irrigation systems that existed, they improved on it. Um, they built the frontier fortress in Milo when, when, um, with the Exodus. There was that frontier fortress at the beach where they had to cross over at the Red Sea, uh, which was sitting to their left. And there was also uh, another fortress when they moved down into the wilderness itself, the wilderness of Sin and the Earth. There was another fortress there sitting at one of the copper mines, but it seemed that it might have been empty at the time when they moved through. You also have the names of Abraham, Isaac, and, and you also have Abraham and Isaac and Joseph during this time, the biblical characters. And then there's the execration text. 1850 BC, which contained the magical formulas, cursing and confusing the king's enemies. Um, well, witchcraft was being practiced, and sorcery was practiced in Egypt, it was forbidden in Israel. And then you have also the tale of Siri that resembles that of Abram. He was an exile that was thrown out of Egypt, went into Palestine. He eventually returned, but he returned with honor, it seems. They don't give us the full story of Salimi, but if you look at Abram, same right of passage, <coughs> we moved into Egypt and the land of honor that he was given. So there's some, of that, some similarities in the story. Then you have the second intermediate period between 1800 and 1570. You have the competing dynasties of Thebes and in the Delta area which again brings disintegration for the, for the second time. Uh, while they are busy disintegrating, there is also the threat of invasion that follows and the Hyksos gains control. Remember the Hyksos, the foreign nation, and Avaris becomes the capital city. Now the Hyksos was a mixture of Semitic or Asiatic stock. Hyksos in Egyptian is, uh, is, is called Chiefs of foreign lands. So, in a sense, uh, Josephus uh, says he's not far when he says it means shepherd kings. Seems there was some royalty attached to them. The reasons some say Joseph went to Egypt during the exist age include uh, a Semitic king would have been more likely to appoint Joseph as his first minister. In other words, if the Egyptians were not familiar with the Hyksos, then the Hyksos would be more than likely to appoint Joseph as his first minister uh, because the Egyptians were, weren't very tolerant of foreign, foreigners. Also, the Hyksos of Aras appears to have been the seat of government when Joseph entered Egypt. Now, there's also a stella which uh, designated as the year 400. Is the stone which has this designation on called year 400 recovered at Tanis, commemorating the <coughs> anniversary of the founding of Avaris. Now, what it simply means is the Ixos was there in 1720 and then Ramses was, re it was rebuilt by Ramses II during 1340 to 1310, which is 400 years later. And that is when the stone was written, or the stone was, 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 was inscribed. And it uh, records the 400th anniversary. So if you work backwards, simply to the Hyksos. 
Genesis 15 to verses 13 again confirms that the Hebrews were to be afflicted for 400 years while Exodus 12 40 extends the period to 30 years, 30 years. If the Exodus, now we need to listen carefully now, if the Exodus is 1440, then Jacob's move to Egypt between, should be somewhere between 1370 and 1840 BC. Okay? Again, like I said earlier, the Hebrew and the Greek text does not agree. Why? Because the Greek text includes the sojourn of 215 years in the 430 years. In other words, the slavery wasn't that long. It was half of the time. <coughs> and that causes a problem <coughs> for the dating of the Exodus. The Hebrew Greek text does not agree, therefore, more, it's more reasonable to place Jacob's move about or before 1700 BC. Okay, then you have the new kingdom. We're almost done, guys. This is the last of the kingdoms. We will move to the others quickly. We have King Amos the first, who spells the Hexos, reunites Egypt, established the 18th dynasty. Uh, he's a rule space to Syrian Palestine. He organizes the army. And he uses their tools to stay abroad there, the bow and the horse-drawn chariot. They use, he uses their very tools to regain power and to maintain power. So you see how they take from each other, learn from each other, and develop again. And then also the feudal system of him. Now similar conditions exist when Joseph designed a plan to prepare the country for a famine. And then you have all the rulers that follow on from this. So let's just move that. I'm going to move from that. Um, they super street who they say are especially related to foreigners. And with the return of the Jews to power, it is likely that the foreigners will make slaves. He may also have begun a place of measures against the large native population remaining in the Delta to prevent the take from from Hexos again. Interesting, just the one thing that I want to remember out of all these notes that I've shown you here is, is what Amen Hotel 3 does. He established a monotheistic religion when he followed the cult of Aten, or the solar disk, whom he declared to be the only God, and he suppresses all other deities, <coughs> obviously, because he sees this as the main God. But they don't only see it as the main God, they also use that to rule when they suppress the other deities. So any other city state, and their priests will become subject to them. So you see how they use the religion to do that. Oh, not only that, this establishment of the monotheistic religion precedes Abraham by a hundred years. They move through the dynasties and then important while bondage the Israelites <coughs> the worship of many gods and little opportunity for instruction in the teachings of Yahweh. And Yahweh now has to manifest himself and new to the Israelites. He literally has to take them out, away from the foreign gods, to learn how to worship him again. <coughs> Exodus, like I said, um, we've worked on two dates, this fourteen fourteen and then this two nineteen. Either or the fourteen forty seems to be the stronger of the two at this stage. So we're not going to look at that particular. There's a lot of evidence that they provide for the first date. Um, even scriptural argument, the uh, second one does not have such a, a lot of evidence. Our, even the strong evidence with the 1290 date is the evidence of the of general destruction in Palestine about the middle of the 13th century, involving towns such as Bethel, Deborah, Lashish, and Harisar. And those were some of the first towns that was demolished when they came into Canaan. So that piece of evidence is strong in that argument again. <coughs> in order for the event, uh, Vettel says little or no additional information can be added to the account of the Exodus since no extra biblical evidence has come to light. That's all that you really need to remember then. And the Exodus leader, I need to run this way. This is very important. Conditions which were significant as Moses appeared on the scene. One, it says in Exodus 1 8, there was a king, a new king, who didn't know Joseph. There was the oppression of Israel by Pharaoh in verse 10, and then also the midwives were told to kill all the Hebrew babies in chapter, uh, verse 16. Now, here's what's important that I need you to remember uh, for the evening. 
and then the rest you can read on your own. Moses was providentially guided in unique preparation for the human impossible role of leading the Israelites out from under bondage. God always prepares you if He knows that there's something that you must do for you. He prepares you beforehand. As a child, he exposed to both Hebrew and Egyptian culture. As a young adult, he gains experience as an Egyptian official, so he's in the courts and all of those things. He's learning the politics of the day, meaning to understand the relationship between the nations and how it exactly works. It's a government system, literature, so forth. He's a learned man. He then becomes, when, when, when after killing the scripture, he flees. Well, what happens? He becomes acquainted with the land where he will clear the Israelites. So God sends him on, prepares him to show him actually where he's going to go and how he's going to have, what he's going to have to deal with when he gets there. And then lastly, there's the special divine revelation. And God says, now you are ready. So God will take you through the process of learning and then he will say, now you are ready. Uh, it's a difficult time sometimes, but the waiting is worthwhile when it does come.